What that meant was that the third race was mayhem. It was pandemonium. So the Jaguar XJR15, uh, I've had, I, I think it's safe to say an obsession with. Ever since I first played Need for Speed, when when it was it was in Need for Speed, it was my car, Need for Speed, Gran Turismo comes out. Well, frankly, Gran Turismo 2 had a lot of cars that have become an inspiration for me and what I'm collecting and what I'm selling. But the XJR15 for me was always a halo car. It was something I aspired to all throughout my teenage years, even though the car was relatively unknown in the United States. It, it was never sold new in the United States. It was never emissions legal here. But thanks to the beauty of the 25 year old rule, 2016 cars start becoming legal. And I finally had the opportunity to start transacting XJR 15s for me to be, have the opportunity to deal with XJR 15, which you know, the world's first fully carbon fiber car designed by Peter Stevens, who designed the McLaren F1, based on the XJR9 and XJR12 that won the 24 Hours of Le Mans. I mean, this is this the stuff the stuff of true legend, and it really is peerless. Oh, not to mention the fact that the car was almost a million dollars brand new in 1991. It is a car with very very few peers, and a car that today its peers are well into the eight figures. And so the opportunity to, to deal with those cars was something that I looked forward to forever. And the XJR15 also had a fascinating history because it wasn't just a road car. It was a race car. They ran a race series called the Jaguar Intercontinental Challenge, which was run before Formula One races in 1991. They only ran three. And what was really, really fun about that series was it, there was a million dollar purse for the winners. And I mean, you had some, some names who were pretty, pretty well known who were racing the cars. T Tiff Nadell was driving one, Fangio drove another, a number of well-known guys racing those cars. So there were three races. And the problem was with a million dollar purse, there was, a, there was a lot of stake. So what you quickly had were these guys with these very expensive cars. I mean, these cars, the race cars were the same price as the road cars. They were still almost a million dollars who were all fighting for an additional million dollars. It was like Survivor. You, know, you had a bunch of guys forming alliances and doing this and doing that. Okay, well, we'll get together. You'll win and then we'll, we'll chop up the pot accordingly, that, that kind of thing. And as a result, the first few races were, you know, they, they were exciting, but they weren't, I don't wanna say glorified parade lapping, but it was not necessarily the most pure form of racing. So the, the organizers clearly recognized this very early on. They decided, all right, enough of this. We are going to just drop the checkered flag at will. So what that means is, you know, the, the checkered flag could have dropped after two laps. The checkered flag could have dropped after 20 laps. So what that means is whoever was in the, whoever was in the lead at that time won. So therefore there was no sandbagging of any kind that you could mess around with. You had to be in front to win. So what that meant was that the third race was mayhem. It was pandemonium. Everyone driving like maniacs, you know, <laughs> cars getting smashed. It was wild. And the craziness of the third race definitely made up for the first two. And for me, really cemented that car's big angry cat nature in, in, my, in my head and in my heart. And it just really adds to the aura of the overall car. Everyone looks at it and listens to it and assumes that it is just this ferocious, just abusive thing. And make no mistake, it is raw, it is unfiltered. It is one of the, it is one of the most visceral road cars that you can buy that has a license plate on it. Anyone who says, you know, oh, a Carrera GT is the, is the most raw car that, that, that money can buy has no idea what they're talking about. An XJR15 is just a different level of car. I mean, and that's not to say a Carrera GT isn't a great car. It's a fantastic car. It's, but a Carrera GT is, is a very, in my opinion, is a comfortable and easy thing to use. 
Carrera GT is a Toyota Camry in comparison to an XJR15. It was controversial, but the reality was is that there was already so much controversy going on on the other side of things, you know, in, in terms of the drivers, that it's, it's sort of all's fair in love and war. <laughs> So, I mean, if if every if if all if all the racers are getting together and and forming alliances and doing doing other things, then you know, I mean, I do not believe that the organizers were trying to necessarily favor one driver in particular. Though the word on the street was from guys who were at TWR at the time. I mean, TWR ceased to exist as a as an entity in two thousand three, but all the guys who were working there at the time, I've you know, a number of them have over the course of these years have become, you know, I've become pretty friendly with. A number of them have stated that Tom Walkinshaw definitely picked favorites when it came to people's cars. And they were definitely cars that were a little faster than others, a little bit better set up than others. That absolutely happened. But the understanding I have is that the organizers were doing this simply to create better racing and they succeeded, and I would say they might have almost been too successful. TWR stands for Tom Walkinshaw, Tom Walkinshaw Racing, and uh, Tom Walkinshaw was a Scottish Scottish gentleman who was a racer. started uh, started with BMWs actually. started in BMW touring car racing. was very very successful, but really met greater success as a manager and an owner, he took some very, very big risks. I mean, he was he was always, he was a, always a huge risk taker, uh, as any good racer is. He took some huge risks and basically footed the bill to develop the Group A touring car program that for Jaguar, which they were extremely, extremely successful with. I mean, for, for those of us who like to go back and look at old, you know, old race clips on YouTube, all you have to do is just look at, you know, look up. Group A XJS at Mount Panorama and just see that thing being driven on the ragged, ragged edge. I mean, you know, people will say, oh, the thing is being driven 11 tenths. No, you take one look at this lap and you go, oh my God, this guy is hanging it out. Walkinshaw was a very effective team team owner, team manager, really, really effective. Um, definitely fulfilled certain stereotypes about about Scottish being being a little being being a little cheap and being a little aggressive. But he was he was brutally effective, and his credibility with the Group A program led him to having the responsibility for develop for for taking over from Group Forty Four, who was. To, to their credit, it was an American-based team. They were campaigning Jaguars in um, in IMSA in the United States, and Walkinshaw basically took over as the works team to campaign to campaign cars at the top level of motorsports for Jaguar. He did a fantastic job. I mean, at the time, I mean, Porsche was seemingly unstoppable. I mean. I will be the first to admit, I mean, the 956, 962 twins, you know, the most most successful sports racing prototypes of all time. And Group C was, it was far more popular than F1 at the time. I mean, the racing was incredible. It was, it was really compelling stuff. And Walkinshaw took them from being, I mean, from basically non-existence to a few short years later to winning the 24 hours of Le Mans and, you know, and to you know, world championship. I mean, that's incredible, really compelling stuff. And he didn't have, I mean, he had, he had budget, but he didn't have as much budget as say Porsche did at the time. And so he was, he was always looking for creative, creative ways to be innovative. And as a result, the XJR series of group C cars with carbon tubs, I mean, that was one of the earliest applications you saw of sports racing prototypes with carbon, with carbon, anything, let, you know, car, let alone carbon tubs. I mean, the 962 was still making do with an aluminum tub and admittedly it did just fine. And he actually bought Aztec Technologies, which was, which manufactured carbon fiber for aerospace applications. And he bought a carbon fiber manufacturer to make better, product for his race cars 
And the XJR15 was born out of this just uncompromising desire to win and to be the best. And I mean, it has that pedigree. To me, any anything that wins the 24 Hours of Le Mans, and, and not just to me, I mean, to collectors, enthusiasts, I think to, to a lot of people, anything that wins the 24 Hours of Le Mans just has a certain aura about it. I mean, look at look at the McLaren F1. I don't believe the McLaren F1, the McLaren F1 would have a fantastic aura regardless of whether or not it won Le Mans, but the Le Mans history with that car absolutely burnishes its image as just, one of, as one of the all-time greats. So Le Mans just has that effect on a car. So for me, you know, having something that has that pedigree is just, it's incredible and it's amazing. And so Walkinshaw was do, doing the Group C thing. The end of Group C, uh, the, you know, the conclusion of the WSC in 1993, Jaguar was in a weird financial position. They pretty much pulled out. Then he formed a partnership with Nissan. And the thing that he's, that I'd say he's probably best known for is, it's a common misconception that the XJR15 and the R390 uh, GT1 have the exact same tub. They don't. They're very, very similar. It's not the exact same, but they're very similar. But Walkinshaw developed that as well. And I mean, even the bankruptcy that, that he, you know, even when he filed for bankruptcy in 2003, it wasn't really that he was bankrupt. It was just a way to get an edge over his creditors and continue down the path. He was a win at all costs kind of guy, whether it was on the racetrack, in business. And while that may have made him a rather prickly guy to do business with, it also made him an absolutely legendary builder of cars. We're here with a very special LaFerrari and we've got a very special deal for you, our VinWiki audience today from Glossit. Now last year, too many of you responded and you broke his website and his fulfillment process. So we've had to limit this one to just 5,000 units. But if you respond now, you're going to get their $150 graphene ceramic coating along with a $50 gloss enhancer detail spray to make the application easier than ever along with an applicator all for just $69.99. So check them out now at the link in the description below and for just $69.99 get the best package of products we've ever been able to offer from Glossit.